So in the last lecture, we defined functions as a special type of set, essentially. So we try to get away from the idea of a function as a formula. This is important because it allows us to extend the idea of functions in ways that we just couldn't do if we were bound down to this idea that we always had to write down a formula to express what the function is. So it really enables us to do a lot more with functions as an idea. Now, because we define it as a set, or as a special type of set, we can ask ourselves, how does this new weird thing that we've defined on terms of sets interact with some of the other things that we do with sets? And so this is why we're going to look at this topic of images and pre-images. So, images and pre-images. And so this is really, how do functions interact with subsets of the domain and then unions and intersections? How do these things interact with each other? So, let's think about a function f takes us from a to b and a subset C of the domain, and a subset D of the codomain. Well, we define the image of this set C, being a subset of the domain, as basically just being the image of every single point in that set C. So F of capital C is the image of every point in C, which gives us a subset of the codomain. Now, twin to this with the idea of a pre-image. So the pre-image of a set D, which is in the codomain, are all the points in A that map into that set D in the codomain. Now we denote this as f to the minus 1 of D, and this is going to be a subset of A, just as the image is a subset of B. So when we take a set D in B, we can ask, what are all the points that map into that set? And that's this pre-image of D. Now, the pre-image, unfortunately, uses this notation f to the minus 1, which you will have seen in a couple of different contexts previously. And so we have to be a little bit careful with pre-images and how we play with them, and in particular how we think of this notation and what it means. So, in particular, in the current context, f to the minus 1 of x is not f of x to the power of minus 1, in part because, well, f might be a function on things that have nothing to do with numbers, so we don't necessarily have any arithmetic associated with the objects in the domain and the codomain. So this might not make sense at all. So this notation f to the minus 1 is not f of x to the minus 1, nor is it 1 on f of x. Now, the pre-image, indeed the stage we're at now when we're playing with functions, is not the inverse function. It's definitely related to it, but it's not the inverse function. We need a bunch of extra conditions satisfied in order for the inverse function to actually exist. Then when it does exist, we unfortunately use that same notation, f to the minus 1, to mean the inverse function. So when you see this notation f to the minus 1, you should think pre-image unless you know that the inverse function exists, and then you can think inverse function. So as a first step, always when you see f to the minus 1, think pre-image. Now let's give ourselves a diagram showing what's going on here. In particular, here we have a set A, which maps to a set B. So this is our domain, this is our codomain f here is a function that takes us from one to the other. So it takes us at point A in A and maps us to f of A sitting in B. It takes a set of points C here over in the domain and maps us to the image of that set f of C sitting inside the codomain. Then we can define a set D here which is sitting inside the codomain of the function. We can ask what points map to that set and that's simply the pre-image here. So, for example, we may have that all of these points here and all of these points here both map into the set D. And so these two sets here would be the pre-image of D. Depends on the function. They might be one set, they might be two sets, they might be five sets. It depends on the properties of the function, just what this pre-image looks like. So the pre-image is typically a slightly more complicated object than the image. Okay. You'll also note here that I've defined f of a, and so this is actually just the range of the function. So this is range of f, okay? And I've drawn this set d carefully so that half of it is inside the range and half of it's outside, and I'm doing that to note that just because we have a set over here in the codomain, well, not every point in that set d is necessarily mapped to by something in the domain. So that's why I've got it sort of hanging half in and out of f of a being the range. So in particular, I've just set this image up so that there are points which map to some of the set, but then there are other bits of d that are not mapped to by anything in the domain, because they might be outside the range of the function. So we'll see some examples of this in a moment. 
Okay, here's a simple example. Let's take the function y equals f of x. So f of x is equal to x squared. And then we can think about what is the image of the interval, so all the real numbers between 0 and 4, and the image of all the real numbers between minus 3 and 1, sorry, minus 3 and minus 1, union 1 and 2. And, you know, we can draw ourselves a little picture here. Here's a nice plot of y equals x squared. Axes I've drawn in and I've drawn in, okay, 1 maps to 1, 2 maps to 4, 4 maps to 16, and so forth. So I've just drawn bits and pieces here to help me understand all the numbers between 0 and 4 end up being mapped to numbers between 0 and 16. Numbers between minus 3 and minus 1 end up being mapped to numbers between 1 and 9, and numbers between 1 and 2 map to numbers between 1 and 4. And so if we think about this, we get these as the image of these two sets. And we can do this a bit more algebraically, a little bit more carefully and rigorously. We know that if x is between 0 and 4, then x squared is between 0 and 16. That's what we're saying here. And if x is between 1 and 2, then x squared is between 1 and 4. That's what we saw here. And if x is between minus 1 and minus 3, then x squared is between 1 and 9. So when we put these two possibilities together, the, if x is in that union, then x squared is in between 1 and 9, which is exactly what we wrote here. Okay. So images are reasonably straightforward, but the pre-images definitely require a little bit more thought. So again, here's a nice picture of y equals x squared. And let's think about the pre-image of the points 0 and 1. Notice here I've written this with braces. So this is just the set of two points, namely 0 and 1. And by forming this pre-image, we're asking, hey, what points over here in the domain map to 0 and 1? And we know that, well, if we take 0 and square it, we get 0. And if we take 1 and minus 1 and square it, we get 1. And so this is the pre-image of the points 0 and 1. It's minus 1, 0 and 1. Similarly, if we take points between 1 and 4 here in the co-domain, we ask what points can map to it. Well, they have to be numbers between 1 and 2 or between minus 2 and minus 1. And again, we can play around with this a bit more algebraically and carefully to ask, hey, if x squared is 0, then we know x has to be 0. x squared is 1, then x is plus or minus 1, just as we got here. On the other hand, if we know that 1 is bigger than x squared, then we know we have to have either x is less than minus 1 or x is bigger than 1. And if x squared is less than 4, then we have to have x is between plus or minus 2. And so again, when we put these together, if x squared is between 1 and 4, then x is either in that range or in that range, just as we wrote here. Okay, so the premage is definitely a little bit more complicated, and we should get used to playing with it. So we can ask some more interesting questions about how do images and pre-images interact not just with subsets, but how do they interact with other things that we do, namely intersection and union. Because again, a function is some operation on sets, which we define in terms of sets. We should ask, how does that new thing we've defined interact with the other things that we know how to do with sets? Namely, union, intersection, subset, maybe set difference, and so forth. Okay? And we can prove some nice theorems about this. And these theorems, not necessarily very, very deep, but they're good problems to work with and good theorems to understand because they test a lot of skills and require us to understand a bunch of stuff coming from sets, functions, and just basic proving skills that we've been doing along the way. So if we let it take a function from A to B, we take a subset of A and a subset of B, then we can show that, that the C, this subset of the domain, that the image of C, if we take the pre-image of that, we end up with a superset of what we started with. So C is always a subset of the pre-image of the image of C. Similarly, if we take a subset of the codomain and ask its pre-image, and then take the image of that, we get a subset of what we started with. Okay, and you can make nice examples that show you that these really are subsets and not equalities. Now, if we go a little bit further and ask about intersection and union, then if we take two sets C1, C2, of the codomain, sorry, of the domain, and sets d1, d2 of the codomain, then we can ask how does the image of the intersection relate to the intersection of the images? And it turns out to be a subset. Okay. If we take the image of the union, that is equal to the union of the images. The pre-image of the intersection is the intersection of the pre-images, and the union the, the pre-image of the union is the union of the pre-images. And so this shows you that pre-images and images interact very nicely with intersection and union. And the only one that's a little bit odd here is this one. The image of the intersection 
is a subset of the intersection of the images. Get that the right way around. All right. So we can prove some of these things, and indeed, some of these things should probably be good exercises for you to do. We might set a few for homework. So let's prove one of these things. So the pre-image of the union is the union of the pre-images. And we'll just prove one direction here. We'll just prove that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side. The other way is pretty similar. So in order to make this work, we're going to use this little bit of logic here, namely that if x is in that pre-image, then we know f of x is in that set. And similarly, if we know that f of x is in that set, then x is in that pre-image. This comes to us directly from the definition of the pre-image. Okay. So if we pull something out of the left-hand side here, so let x be in that pre-image of the union, then we know by this bit of logic that f of x is in that union. Well, that just tells us that f of x is in the first set or it's in the second set. Well, when it's in the first set, again, by this bit of logic here, we know x is in that pre-image. And similarly, when it's in the second set, by the same bit of logic, we know that x is in that pre-image. And then we can use the fact that if x is in a given set, then it's in that set union whatever else we want. And so we know in both cases that x is in the union of the two pre-images. And as I said, the other inclusion is actually very, very similar to prove that this is actually an equality here. Okay. So let's look at another one. Let's look at the image of the intersection being just a subset of the intersection of the images. I have to get that right each time. It's a bit awkward. So to do this, we're going to use the fact that if x is in C, then f of x is in f of C. That comes to us very directly from the definition of the image. Additionally, we should just note here the inverse, sorry, that the reverse implication here, the converse of this is actually false, as we'll see in a moment. Now, if we know that y is in f of c, then that tells us that there's got to be something in c whose image, f of x, is actually in f of c. Okay, so that if y is in f of c, there's got to be something in c that maps to it. Okay, so we'll use both of those bits of logic to make this proof work. So, if y is in the left-hand side, then that tells us, again, by this bit of logic here, that there's got to be something in this intersection that maps to y. Well, if x is in that intersection, we know it's in the first set, and we know it's in the second set. Now, because it's in the first set, again, using this little bit of logic here, we know that f of x is in f of c1, so we know y is in there. Since x is in c2, we know that y, being the image of fx, is in f of c2. And so we know that y is in the intersection of these two sets because it's in both of them. And so we've shown that if it's in the left-hand side, then it's in the right-hand side. Now let's prove that the reverse inclusion doesn't necessarily hold, and we'll do that using y equals x squared. You know, this is a very, very familiar function. And this is a very useful function for mucking around with images and pre-images because it's a good example and counterexample of a bunch of things. Well, it's shown up a few times already. So let's take this function and think about C1 being the set that just contains minus 1, and C2 being the set that just contains 1. In that case, both of these sets, the image of both of these sets, f of C1, f of C2, is just the same set, namely 1, or the set that contains 1. So this tells you, if we start putting things together and thinking about this statement here, that f of C1 intersection f of C2 is the set that contains 1, because they're equal. But if we think about f of the intersection, well, that intersection is just the empty set, so the image of the intersection is actually just empty. And so we see that this reverse inclusion doesn't actually hold. Notice, I think I remarked on this in the previous slide, that this is enough to tell you that just because f of x is in f of c, it does not imply that x is in c. So for example, if we set x equals minus 1 and c is the set that contains 1, then we see that f of x is equal to 1, which is in the set 1, which is just the image of c, but x is not in c. Okay? And all of these things fail, all of this stuff fails here, precisely because we can find two numbers, x1, x2, two things in the domain of the function that map to the same point. But two things that are not equal mapping to the same thing. And that's why all of this fails. This is an important point that we'll come back to in the next lecture particularly. Okay, let's do one more proof here. So let's show that C is a subset of the pre-image of the image of C. Okay, so... Let's take something on the left-hand side, so pull out x in c. Now, since x is in c, we know that its image is in f of c. Now, to make the rest of the proof a little bit easier, I'm going to define d to be f of c, just so that we can you know, sort of take a step back from f of f of f. 
So let's write d as f of c. And so this tells us, this line here, that f of x is in d. Well, that's just what we need to define a pre-image. If f of x is in d, then we know that x is in the pre-image of d. Now, because d was just f of c, this tells us that x is in the pre-image of f of c, just because d here was f of c, just as required. So we've shown that something is on the left-hand side, then it's in the right-hand side. And again, we can show the reverse inclusion is false, by again, taking our friend f of x equals x squared, by taking, say, c equals 2, then f of c is 4. But the pre-image of 4 contains the points minus 2 and 2, because, of course, minus 2 squared is 2 squared is 4. And thus, we see that the pre-image of the image is minus 2, 2, which is not a subset of 2. So that reverse inclusion is false, so that's not an equality. And again, you can see the whole reason this fails is because we can find x1 not equal to x2, such that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. And I'm writing on top of my face there, which is a bit strange. But you can find different points that map to the same thing, and that's why that fails. And we'll come back to that point in the examples of functions that do that or do not do that in the next lecture. Let's stop there.